John, congratulations. Please come up and let me give you the Tom Rowe Award. admire and respect Paul Jacob. Those of you who don't know the story, uh, Paul and I worked together years ago at Americans for Limited Government, did a whole bunch of in, uh, initiative campaigns around the country. As he pointed out, I was new to all of this. And um, afterwards, uh, Paul was indicted along with two others by the Attorney General of Oklahoma uh, for redressing his grievances against the government. And uh, Paul was an amazing, <laughs> courageous, fearless, relentless warrior while they were trying to incarcerate him. Paul, I love you so much, thank you. Now, I'm a sales guy. I started out my career in the sales management business, and uh, I used to spend a lot of time looking at numbers. And one day, a young sales manager came in by the name of Allison, and she said, John, you always tell us we're in the people business, but I see you spending so much time looking at numbers. I said, well, Allison, I do that because numbers tell stories about people. Teaches, teaches us how we can help them. Numbers tell stories about Tracy Sharp and SBM. 58 state think tanks. You heard the numbers earlier, 650 plus people here. 200 and whatever number of organizations. It's an amazing testament to performance that makes a difference in the world. Tracy, thank you so much for all you've done to help us. And my wife, Julie, is sitting right here. And my daughter, Lauren. They both know that I might start channeling my inner John Boehner and get weepy, so I have to be careful. <laughs> I do cry during American Idol, so this is not an idle threat on my part. Families sacrifice a lot when all of us go out and fight for liberty in many ways. One of my favorite stories, I get a little hate mail from time to time, and uh, Lauren's an amazing kid in so many ways. Uh, one time I came home and I, we have a rule at our house, no whining, and uh, she's adhered to that, which I'm very proud of. And uh, I came home one day and I started whining about a piece of hate mail that had shown up, and this is about three years ago. And she said, Dad, you decided to do this. You chose it. You need to toughen up. Remember, no whining. <laughs> I'm just grateful for both of you being here. Lauren, of course, really put uh, the humbleness into all of this because I was explaining to them what this was all about and that Lauren was going to be able to come and do this. And she said, Dad, that's great. Does this mean I get to miss two days of school? <laughs> and it did. It does. And so she's very pleased by that. <laughs> I do get a little emotional. I admit that. Those who work with me know that I'm uh, always on the edge uh, when it comes to these moments. And I get particularly emotional when I think of my colleagues at the Illinois Policy Institute. I really admire all of you so much. Could you all stand up, please? Wherever you are. Thank you. I admire your tenaciousness. I admire your optimism and your happy warrior selves. I admire so much your candidness with one another and God knows with me as we all try to improve and get a little better. Thank you so much. I am deeply aware that I stand here as a proxy for the work you all do every day, and I'm just so proud of all of you. Thank you. I'm very humbled when I think about the legacy that Tom Rowe left, not just us, but the world. Uh, and as alluded to by Tracy earlier, it is a legacy, but more importantly, he gave us each a gift, a gift of vision, a vision that every state, state by state, 
capital by capital, liberty needed protecting in America. It seems to me that the first phase of Tom Rowe's vision is now largely complete. Under Tracy and SPN board's leadership, with the investment of SPN's donors, with the hard work of the incredible SPN staff, second best only to the Illinois Policy Institute, <laughs> and most importantly, through the hard work of all of you and the 58 independent think tanks fighting for liberty, we are now a powerful force to create change in America. Yeah. Plus, we know this is true because Ed Schultz told us so on MSNBC. <laughs> Well, he told the world, or at least a couple hundred of his nightly viewers, <laughs> that you're all doing great work all around the country and you're winning. Now, of course, in case you haven't heard, we're not all the way back to seeing liberty prevail in Illinois or America. We have a great challenge ahead of us. We must keep fighting. So I think the real question for us, and we've heard a little bit about this that I'm going to talk about now over the course of the last couple of days, is where do we go from here to live up to Tom Rowe's legacy, his gift? First, well, I think that I agree that think tanks must focus on policy. I also believe we must work harder to recognize that policy flows through a political process. And political victories and losses are not controlled by those of us in this room. They are controlled by the persuadable middle, those voters who dip in and out of elections every two years and are swayed to one side or the other by themes and stories, both large and small. Too often we are losing this battle for the hearts and minds of America when we should be winning. We must fully understand that the battle lines are drawn clearly between those who believe in the progressive paradigm and those who believe in the liberty paradigm. And the progressives, in my view, and I'm sure yours, have had most of the advantages over about the last hundred years. I think the second thing we must understand is that the progressives hold that advantage only because America has lost sight of a simple truth, and we as a movement have lost sight of a simple tool. The simple truth is that the free market system and liberty principles are the greatest force for good ever created in the human sphere. I realize you all know that, but do we tell the world that in a way that it can understand and thus affect political and policy decision-making. We clearly are not, or we wouldn't see liberty threatened the way it is today. Thus, it bears repeating, the free market system is the greatest force for good ever created in the human sphere. We can always clap for that. One of, uh, one of President Reagan's, Reagan's frequent themes is the idea that America is a shining city on a hill. You're all familiar with that. Reagan used it well over and over again because he understood the power of story and he understood the power of repetition. That shining city on a hill is an aspirational, uplifting image that we each fill in our own personal way with our mind's eye. We each in our own way when we hear it tell ourselves a little story about what that city on a hill means to each of us personally. That's why this quote sticks so well years later, decades later. That city on a hill represents so many things, but we've lost sight, in my view, of the most important thing that hill represents. You see, that hill, on that hill, is the moral high ground of the liberty movement. The amazing truth is, and the amazing miracle is, I really think it is a miracle, that our ideas are not only the best way to organize society in keeping with the founding principles, but our ideas are the best way to help the poor and disadvantaged. It's an amazing thing when you think about it. Our ideas are the best way to help the poor and disadvantaged, and that is the simple truth we must tell over and over and over again, and thus regain the moral high ground in the policy debates that persuade the poor, persuadable middle. To tell this simple truth, we must use the tool that we've been learning about this week, the art of storytelling, storytelling with great heroes. Stories and heroes that stick. Stories based in truth and told with honest emotional connections. We must take these storytelling lessons with us, fit them into, yes, our holistic strategy, leverage their power to change hearts, then change minds, and then change laws. 
We too often tell the wrong stories with the wrong heroes. Take gas prices, just one example. Not so long ago, I was at a gas station watching a woman fill up her tank. She looked very stressed. She was standing there with what appeared to be a grocery list in her hand, glancing back and forth from the list to the back seat of her car where her two young children sat. And then she would glance at the dials on the pump. You've all seen this before yourselves. It used to stop at $40. The pennies and the dimes were spinning up faster and faster and faster and faster. The dollars rolling up like a Vegas slot machine. But for her, it was coming up snake eyes. It used to stop at 40, as I mentioned, and it kept going 40, 45, 50, and finally, mercifully, it stopped just past $60. She paused, she looked at her kids, and with a swipe of the pen, she crossed another item off her list. She slammed the nozzle into the pump and was gone. That list, that grocery list, and her what was her grocery list, and her life and her children's lives had been changed for the worse because gasoline is $4 a gallon in Chicago. When we talk about energy policy, we tend to make the stories here of the oil companies. We talk about expanding domestic production in Anwar off the Atlantic or Pacific coast or in the Gulf, all to increase supply and thus lower cost. Those are important. But our hero is that mom at the gas pump who just crossed off some food items from her grocery list because President Obama is empowering government instead of empowering her. We need to choose better heroes we need to tell their stories. That mom is our hero, and we need to tell her story about that policy at the point where it insects, intersects her life at the gas pump. We have an infinite, an infinite number of heroes that we can tell stories about. I know a college student who talked his way into a job at a gray iron foundry. You may have seen video of this over the years, the big factories where they take boiling cauldrons of liquid iron, they pour it into molds, and they make engine blocks and other small and heavy industrial parts. They are taken out and cooled and put into large bins and taken by forklifts over to workstations, where our young college student friend, a very ambitious young man, took many jackhammers and grinding tools and worked off the imperfections. It was very demanding work, but this guy went at it with enthusiasm. He pulled some strings to get this job because it paid more than working in the assembly line next door. He rocked through the first bin and another showed up and another, and soon he noticed conversations at workstations nearby from the other veteran workers. Being clueless, after all, he was in college, no offense to those of you who are here. I happen to know this guy who was definitely clueless at this time. He worked harder. It wasn't long before the supervisor came over to him, and our college student turned and took off his ear protection and looked expectantly at the man. It was a brief conversation. The supervisor said, you're going too fast. Slow down, just keep pace with the others. What occurred to our young friend is that this union was creating a ceiling on his productivity, his desire to do well. The union imperative was asking him to be less than great to do less than what was possible and worthy. This union ceiling was not for him. He was not gonna live in that world. He's often thought of those colleagues he got to know over that summer. Many were good people with ambition and talent. They yearned to produce and were told not to. He felt sad when he realized that day by day, year by year, they each had their spirits crushed by the union ceiling. Make no mistake. We absolutely must regain the moral high ground by telling the right stories with the right heroes and even union members who yearn for the natural desires of the human spirit can be our heroes. Think about the progressive paradigm, an ever-expanding government drawing more and more people into de dependency for their food, their shelter, their clothing, their education, and now their health care. Unions draw talented people into their Orwellian grip and limit their upside potential. After all, all union members are created equal in a terrible perversion of that phrase. The progressive paradigm creates an ever-expanding dependency class who are more and more limited by what I like to call the dependency ceiling. Yes, you can, of course, achieve a measure of security for you and your family, but what you give up is the very essence of freedom and the human spirit. This is the progressive paradigm, where the goal is to create a dependency ceiling, locking people in below their true potential 
and a distorted pursuit of equality. That is what they are selling. And they are winning all too often for all too long. We are selling the liberty paradigm. They want to empower government over people. We want to empower people to pursue their dreams and lift the human spirit. But we can win, and we will win, if we become great storytellers, telling the greatest stories ever told about liberty. That simple tool we need to regain the moral high ground and see our policies put into law is the power of story, the power of heroes. When you think about it, when you think about history, the power of telling the greatest stories ever told has long changed the world for the better. If we tell our stories, then we can change the hearts, and then we can change the minds, and then we can change policies that will change people's lives for the better. Last year, Taryn Bragdon urged us to be great. Let's be great storytellers. Let's tell the greatest stories ever told about liberty. I know from my own life, this is going to be really hard, that policy changes lives for the better, for the worse. Because you see, of course, that woman at the gas pump, that's a true story today. But it was true in 1973, when I was 14 years old, and that woman was my mother. Divorced, mother of three, trying to make ends meet. It was difficult for her, it's difficult for people today. We need to remember those heroes. She is our hero. And the thing that is really important to remember is that how well we do our work, how well we live up to Tom Rowe's gift, does make a difference. Your work truly matters in changing lives for the better. And of course, as you probably have now figured out, that factory worker was me 32 years ago. I was definitely clueless. Those lessons have stayed with me, and that is why even today, I know there are union heroes yearning to be free of the union ceiling. Let's help set them free. Amen. If we do this, if we become great storytellers, telling the greatest stories ever told, then the world will know some, a simple truth that is already known to us in this room. For the truth is that free markets and liberty are the greatest force for good ever created in the human sphere, and not just for the middle class or the affluent, but for the poor and disadvantaged. That is our moral high ground, and we will win from the moral high ground. And we know that when liberty prevails, prosperity surely follows. And not just prosperity of the material kind, though that is certainly good and necessary, but prosperity of the human spirit. That is what we are fighting for. So let's tell the greatest stories ever told, and in doing so, let's make Tom Rowe proud by changing the world. Thank you.